Today I'm going to talk about uh, privacy and access control for outsourced personal records, or putting it differently, how to port single client ORM to multi client ORM. So I'm Manuel Reinhardt, and this is joint work with uh, Matteo Maffei, Giulio Malavolta, and Dominique Schroeder. So let me get started with a motivating example. So some of you might know or might have even used personal health records, which is a health record system in which the patient, Bob, has full control over his private personal um, health data and can share it with healthcare personnel, clinicians, and so on. So for example, systems that are already existing, web-based, are, for example, um, um, patients like me or um, Health Vault, where people can import health data and can share it with selective institutions, applications, and other persons. And as I said, this is web-based, so we are striving for a solution where the patient puts his data into the cloud and can then, for example, let the nurse retrieve the treatment plan, where the doctor can then uh, add prescriptions for the pharmacy that can then turn into medicine for the patient. Also, the doctor can immediately bill the health insurance for services and the health insurance can then pay the doctor for this bill. Now, naturally, in this scenario, we have a lot of security and privacy issues, three of which I want to point out here in particular. So the first one being secrecy. That means um, if the nurse, for example, wants to see the doctor's bill for the health insurance, which is none of her concern, then this should, of course, be prevented. Uh, dually, the integrity of data, that means if the doctor prescribes a generic drug, a drug, which is usually cheaper than an original drug, then the pharmacy should not be allowed to change this into the original drug in order to generate more revenue. And finally, we're interested in protecting the patient from the, cloud, uh, from the cloud provider, namely obliviousness, meaning that if the doctor, for example, retrieves the treatment plan or the laboratory findings and does some operation on it, the cloud provider should not be able to tell which operation he performed on this data, neither should he, able, uh, should he be able to tell which of the two files he retrieved. And of course, we're not considering this in, the, in this limited scenario only, but we're more interested in a more general scenario where we have, so take your favorite cloud provider, we have the cloud, and we have a database owner who wants to outsource his data to the cloud and wants to share it with selective clients of his choice. Now, if we were only interested in this left part of the scenario, like the database owner and the cloud, then our favorite solution of choice would be Oblivious RAM. Oh, sorry. Uh, and, the, and in order to, to, um, yeah, to provide operations, um, the, the, the clients can read and write on, on index data, and the, the cloud provider can addition, uh, the, the, the database owner can additionally um, add entries to the, uh, to the database. He can change permissions of existing entries, or he can also add clients to his shareholders. And as I said, if we were only interested in this left part of the uh, solution, then our, um, our, yeah, our solution of choice would be Oblivious RAM, which is a technique invented originally in 1996 by Goldreich and Lovstrovsky in order to conceal from an observer of the storage in the cloud to um, uh, the, the, the access pattern of the clients act, um, operating on this storage. So for example, here in the upper part, or in the, so in the two scenarios, it should be indistinguishable whether, for example, the database owner on the upper part reads index I and then index I, or whether in the lower part he reads index I and then index J. So this should be indistinguishable. And in the last two decades, there have been a lot of efficient realizations thereof. For example, Path ORM, which was presented by Stefanov and co-workers two years ago at CCS, um, unfortunately, all of, these cloud, uh, all of these ORM solutions only work in the single client setting, and they are not trivially to be ported into the multi-client setting. And this is what we, are willing to achieve, what we are willing to achieve. So our contributions are, first of all, a formal framework, framework in which we define the notion of group, of group oblivious RAM or multi-client oblivious RAM. And we define several security and privacy properties, three of which I want to focus today. So secrecy, integrity, and obliviousness against the server all of which I illustrated before, and we define them, or we formalize them as cryptographic games in a unified attacker model where the database owner is honest, the server is honest but curious, and the, cl uh, the clients might be potentially malicious. We have one more restriction, namely that the server should not be um, able to collaborate or collude with clients. Moreover, 
addition to this formal framework, we also present three different constructions, ranging from a generic one, uh, what we call a GORAM, a more efficient one, which we call a countable GORAM, and an even more efficient, uh, efficient one, which we call scalable GORAM. And um, as I said, they are more efficient when we go from left to right, and we have to slightly relax security and flexibility in order to achieve this efficiency. And today I'm going to focus on this lower part of the, um, of the story. So before I start presenting our own solutions, uh, let me quickly recap what PathORM is doing and how it looks like. So in PathORM, the database is basically a binary tree with n leaf nodes, where n is the number of entries. And every node can capture up to a constant amount of entries. And I abstract away from the stash, which is used in order to achieve um, non-overflowing buckets um, today. So I just treat this as the root node. And an entry in uh, PathORM looks like that. So we have an index i and a data d, which are encrypted using symmetric encryption. And throughout the algorithm, we maintain the invariant that indexes of uh, entries are mapped to leaf nodes. And if you want to find an entry in the database, we just look up the leaf index. And we will then find the entry that we are uh, interested in somewhere on the path from this leaf to the root. And intuitively, in order to achieve obliviousness, whenever you access an entry i, you have to remap uh, this index i to a new leaf and maintain the invariant then, meaning that this entry has to lay on the path, on the new path from the leaf index to the, to the root node. So how, does the, how do the read and write algorithms look in, uh, uh, specifically? So as I said, we first look up the leaf index, then we download the path locally on the computer. Um, we locate the entry, and in the case of read, we, change, uh, we read the payload. In the case of write, we change the payload. Finally, as I said, we assign a new leaf index, and we have to make sure that the invariant still holds. That means the entry has to lie on the path from the leaf to the root. In this case, the, the new leaf is in another subtree of the root, so the root is the only common node. So the entry must lay in the, in the root. And in order to conceal from the server what we did, we just re-encrypt the entire path and upload it back to the server. Now, this works nice in the single client setting. However, in the multi-client setting, we notice that we have this little symmetric key K here. And of course, you can give access to other clients by handing over this key K. Unfortunately, this is only possible in an all or nothing manner. That means no profile, secrecy, integrity, and access control. Either you have access to everything or to nothing. And this is what we achieve in our first solution, GORAM. There, if we look at the entry structure, the first thing we change is in order to, because we have malicious clients, and we'll come to this later in the next slide, why we need public key encryption instead of symmetric key encryption. And additionally, what we also add is two ciphertexts, cauth and cdata that you see on the right, which are both predicate encryption ciphertexts. And C auth encrypts one, C data encrypts D, the payload. Now, what is predicate encryption and how can it be used to enforce access control? So intuitively, every client gets a secret key SK, which is associated to a predicate F. And roughly speaking, a ciphertext can only be decrypted. A ciphertext that is generated with, a, with an attribute X can only be decrypted if, the predicate if this attribute X fulfills the predicate F. So for example, in, the, in C auth, we, uh, we encrypt with predicate XW. W stands for write. That means only clients with write access can decrypt this ciphertext. And C data is encrypted with XR, which means that only clients with read access can decrypt this ciphertext. Intuitively, C data stands for um, secrecy, and C auth is used for uh, preserving integrity. Now, how do the algorithms change? As I said, we have malicious clients. Up to the point where we download the, uh, the path, everything stays the same. However, we can now not change the payload right away because m clients might be potentially malicious, so we just postpone this to the end. Instead, in the first place, we just simulate this, uh, this read that we do, and we also distinguish between, now we distinguish between the entry that we read and the entry that we want to write. And there's also an entry which is, which is called D, which is a dummy entry, and just to note, uh, to mention that, this entry is only needed to, um, to make read and write indistinguishable, as suggested by the original definition of obliviousness. So now, what, we, what do we do in the next step? So again, we select a new leaf index, 
And we maintain the invariant. That means the entry that we changed or the entry that we accessed has to lie on the path from the leaf node to the root. This is what happens here. But now we distinguish between read and write. So in the case of write, we put exactly the entry that we want to write in the top position of the root. In the case of read, however, now we put a dummy entry in the, uh, in the, in the top position of the root. And we notice that dummy entries are writable by everyone. The next step is to upload this path to the server and also to re-randomize it in order to conceal from the server what we did. And as I said, clients might be potentially malicious. So what we add now in additionally is an integrity proof on this path, which shows to the server that apart from changing the randomness used for the encryption and the order of the elements, we didn't change anything. The server verifies this and then replaces the path. Now, Notice that we have not changed any entry so far, so we just changed the order. So what is left to be done is, as you see this blue box, changing the payload in the case of write. So what we do is we change the top position of the, of the root node in which the entry that we want to write to is laying, or a dummy entry in the case of read, which everyone can write to. And additionally, we attach an integrity proof, which shows that we are eligible to write this entry. And this is how we achieve integrity, and the other properties. Now, look, taking a closer look at the efficiency, we see that Gorem uses these integrity proofs in order to achieve integrity. Um, this gives, of, gives us, of course, best security properties. Unfortunately, it's not very efficient in terms of computation and communication. So we thought of ways to improve the efficiency, and one way to do that is slightly relaxing integrity and introducing an after-the-fact enforcement of, of integrity, namely accountability in combination with logging or auditing. And with this technique, we can then restore the database after a bad action happens, as opposed to not letting the bad action happen at all. So how does, and this is what we achieve in our second construction, accountable GORAM. So let's see how the entry structure changes. So this is the entry structure of GORAM. Now what we change as I said, this public key encryption was only necessary for the integrity proof, so this is the first thing we change. We change back to symmetric encryption. And now we need an accountability mechanism. So what do we do? We add a chameleon signature of the index, C auth, and C data signed by the data owner's public key, uh, secret key. And the nice thing about chameleon signatures is that once you know some kind of secret, some kind of trapdoor, you can change the message which is signed without invalidating sigma. And the message in particular, I mean C data. So if you are able to write to this entry, you will change C data. And then you have to change the message in, without invalidating sigma. Now, this trapdoor must hence go to some position where only clients that are able to write to can, um, can uh, extract it, which means in C auth. As I said, if you know the trapdoor, you can change the message. You can change the entry. So this is, um, this is a countable GORAM. Now, if, if people, so if clients download entries intuitively, they verify whether the signature is valid on the ingredients, and if not, the logging mechanism takes place and the database is restored, and clients are being blamed. I don't want to go into detail because of time reasons. So we thought of how to improve this scheme more in scalable GORAM, and we noticed that predicate encryption actually gives us much stronger access control properties as we actually need. So predicate encryption gives us role-based access control or attribute-based access control, while we only need read-write access control per entry. And a cryptographic primitive which was exactly designed for this purpose is broadcast encryption. So we exchange predicate encryption for broadcast encryption and simply encrypt for the clients that may write and the clients that may read. For example, broadcast encryption is also used in some pay TV um, um, of, uh, providers, so it, it must naturally be fast. Um, and in order to prove my claims that this is actually the most efficient solution, let's have a look at the numbers. So when we look at GORAM on the left um, figure, we see that, so the red, uh, the red line is for the, the, the computation time on the client for reading and writing, the black line is for the computation time for reading and writing on the server. So you see that these integrity proofs, they, they take a lot of time. So we need 110 up to 180 seconds, varying the storage size from one gigabyte to one terabyte. And um, 
we see that in the countable GORAM, dropping the integrity proofs, we gain two orders of magnitude. That means, so now we distinguish the red line, which is reading, the blue line, which is writing. Um, so we, we gain um, yeah, two orders of magnitude. We, we, we drop down to 1.2 seconds up to uh, two seconds for reading and then 1.6 seconds up to 2.4 seconds for writing. Now looking at the scalable solution even, this, um, this becomes apparent when we look at the number of clients that vary. So notice that the, right, uh, the, the, the x-axis on the right is logarithmic scale. So this is actually not an, an exponential increase, but just a linear one. So I want to highlight here just these two numbers. So we have, for 10 clients in a countable GORAM, we need four seconds to write and two seconds to read. The same time, we need in scalable GORAM for 10,000 clients. So here we have an, a drop down of four orders of magnitude. And finally, the last comparison is the one to the standard solution path ORM, the single client solution. So if we look at the overhead in terms of communication, we achieve roughly 1%, more or less. This you can see on the right. So on the left, you see the two, uh, the two communication uh, lines, which are almost overlapping. And combining this with, for example, a mobile connection of 4G or LTE, um, this gives us a combined communication computation overhead of only 7% for reading and 8% for writing. So hold on, 7% for porting single client to multi-client. I think that's a low price to pay. So let me conclude my talk. So I've shown you a formal framework for group ORAM, where we define le several security and privacy properties in a unified attacker model. And I've also shown you three different constructions, namely GORAM, accountable GORAM, and scalable GORAM, all achieving, so going from, from top to bottom, increasing in efficiency, going from the first to the second, slightly decreasing the security, and going from the second to the third, slightly decreasing the flexibility of the solution. And if you only remember two things of this talk, remember those two. Slight re slightly relaxing security properties can highly achieve the efficiency of the schemes. And the second thing, single client ORAM to multi-client ORAM only costs seven or eight percent. Thank you. So we have some time. We have some time for questions. Please come up to the microphones if you have questions. Um, while people are coming up, I'll, I'll ask first question. Um, so you've got very impressive results here. Um, it seems like it's still a long way from being deployable. Uh, is that true? And if so, what what's necessary to get to the point where this could be used for real systems? So I think. If the database sizes are not too big, so for example, in this personal, in this, this personal health record scenario, we're talking of about 250 megabytes. Um, so for example, the electronic health cards that are actually deployed at the moment, they only can store 64K, so which is not really much. So 250 megabytes, for example, can be handled in, in quite an efficient amount of time. Um, so there I would say it, it can be deployed already in practice. Yeah. But if you're, if you're talking about like uh, terabyte or even petabyte, then, then, we, then there's still a way to go, indeed. Okay, let's thank our speaker again.